Hello, everybody. I'm going to give it just another few moments for people to log in. Uh, we have people logging in from all over uh, the United States and other parts of the world. So I'll just give it another minute before we start the program. Thank you very much for taking time out of your busy, hectic schedules uh, to tune in. I would have to say it's four o'clock uh, where I'm located, but I know that time uh, varies depending on your location. Just a couple of housekeeping rules before we get started. If you have any questions, uh, you can certainly put those into the chat. Uh, we have somebody who's monitoring the chat, uh, and uh, we'll do the best that we can to uh, answer your questions. Uh, the ability to answer questions depends on how many we get, but what I promise we'll definitely leave time for people to ask questions. Uh, as I get into our uh, great selection of speakers today, uh, it, there'll be additional information about what they're working on, projects, websites. So if you inquire more information regarding our speakers, that'll also be put into the chat where you can click on and see all the amazing stuff that they're doing uh, currently and where they're working on and what, what they're doing. Uh, so it is now a little bit after four o'clock. Thank you everybody again for joining us. Uh, we're very, very excited. Uh, this is the first of three webinars, uh, first of two other webinars, I should say, uh, in conjunction with the SC Johnson College of Business, the Hotel School at Cornell University uh, in uh, Black History Month. And really, we have a theme going, uh, talking about uh, how wide in representation the industry is. So this title is Diverse Culinary Family, Representation, Identity, Inclusivity. My name is Doug Miller. I am a lecturer here in the hotel school. I've been here now for five years, uh, been in the industry for now for 35 years, uh, working in all parts of the country, as close as here in Ithaca, New York, and as far away as Hawaii. Uh, I currently in the hotel school teach a restaurant management class and also teach a, a, a beer appreciation class. And I'm very, very excited to be moderating uh, such a wonderful panel. And really the goal of this is just to have a discussion. You know, really just having a discussion on, you know, uh, what, uh, how do these individuals get started in the industry? Uh, what are their passion is? What are the ethos? What are they working on? And potentially where they want to see uh, the industry uh, go to. Um, they all uh, have uh, uh, accomplished many great things in their own different, uh, and on the different ways. And really just pulling that thread together and just having a conversation. Again, if you have any questions, uh, please put those in the chat. Uh, we'll do the best we can uh, that to answer those questions. And also I'll put in some follow-up information if you want to follow these individuals, either through social media or the websites or the amazing things they are going to do. So I'm going to have them self-introduce themselves. Instead of me talking about them, they're going to talk about themselves. The one thing you're not supposed to do, but that's okay. They're going to talk about themselves. And I'm going to start off uh, with Chef Lenise uh, coming to us from New York. Chef Lenise, please, uh, what, how'd you get started in the industry? What has been your journey? Well, yes, my name is Chef Lenise Lee Streeter, and I am in New York. I'm in the Bronx, New York. I have a business called Lenny Lynn Specialties, LLC. And I started uh, really years ago when I was about six years old when my parents bought me an Easy Bake Oven. And that's where my love of baking began. I had an aunt named Sister, that we called her Sister. Her real name is Daisy, but we called her Sister. And She's the aunt that I followed around the kitchen all the time, hanging underneath her apron strings. So she taught me a lot about cooking and a lot about baking, but my passion was always baking. When my dad came home from work, no matter how tired he was, he always ate whatever I made and always praised me for it. So that's how my love of baking began and that's how it grew. But back in 2005, I decided I would go to culinary school and become a pastry chef. So I went into the Institute of Culinary Education where I got my pastry chef diploma from. And from there, I've just been baking nonstop. The Easy Bake Oven was probably the best uh, uh, oven you worked with. I miss mine, quite frankly. Well, yes, it really is. And it was a real Easy Bake Oven. Now they have a light bulb with it. But before, you know, your parents had to plug it in and you had to really maneuver it. So it was the best oven yet. And Chef Askew, please, you're also, we'll keep the New York theme going. Please, uh, what is going on? How did you get started in the industry? Uh, well, I have a very um, kind of unorthodox story. And as that, um, you know, I started out when I was 14 and a half years old uh, at a culinary vocational program in my high school. 
And uh, as a result of that, you know, and, and, and every, every teacher was old school. We had a master butcher. I mean, this is uh, early 80s. I mean, everyone there was, uh, you know, um, retiring, but they were still old school. So I got some real old school education at 14, and it was actually hired by uh, an upper middle class family to be a private cook. And that was really interesting um, because they were white. Um, they wanted specifically someone of color. And I guess uh, I was the only one that qualified, uh, you know, at, at in, in 10th grade. Um, but uh, that was a learning experience. And I learned uh, to be more confident about, you know, I mean, they gave me the keys to their house and I had to do the shopping. And it was all after school. And then uh, I really was intrigued about the industry. Uh, and at 16, uh, I lied about my age and uh, wanted to get into the in the big restaurant scene. So I did in a, in a high volume American cuisine scratch. Baker comes in at three thirty in the morning, worked myself up from pantry, uh, 700 covers on Saturday. So um, I really realized uh, two things. One, it, it was a brutal sport. And, uh, you know, number two, I could make it because I did work my way up from pantry to the line. And, and then at that point, I really wanted to kind of discover uh, every part of the different segments where you were small house, um, you know, I, I worked in uh, uh, casual themed restaurants. Um, and I, you know, I wanted to learn the systems about how, you know, when food comes into a place, where does it go? How is it prepared? How is it stored? And so I really wanted to get systems and then, I uh, started working for multiple chefs, Italian chefs, French chefs. So, um, you know, by the time I went to the Culinary Institute of America when I was 20, I was already a sous chef, knew some fundamentals, and was really ready to learn and ask um, the deeper questions that most students don't ask instructors. And I think that's why, uh, you know, a lot of instructors invested in me and, uh, you know, did very, very well at that point of, uh, you know, graduating towards the top of my class because um, I was able to learn on that level. Uh, and, and at that point started, you know, the first student chapter of color and Culinary Institute of America 30 years ago, which still in existence, the Black Culinary Society. Um, so I'm very proud of that, knowing that uh, uh, Culinary Institute of America had a great education, but, um, you know, still struggled with that inclusive environment uh, for, for students of color. And, um, you know, after graduating, you know, uh, on, on the on the nonprofit side, you know, um, you know, formed the alumni chapter, the first one for blacks at the Cul with the Culinary Institute of America seal. And then on the professional side, you know, I had the I had the paper, you know, from the CIA so I could start, you know, doing um, the work in areas in like in hotels and fine dining um, country clubs and really learning everything else to summarize 35 years. I've done everything, including research and development. Um, one of the, the first black regional chef in healthcare, um, everything except for cruise ships, I've accomplished that. So I have a, a very wide bandwidth that's vertical and horizontal, uh, in the culinary and food service industry. And a little uh, secret I'm going to share with everybody. We were actually on campus at the CIA at the same time. Uh, yeah. Back when the campus was much smaller. And I also received a fabulous uh, education there. Went on later on to teach at the CIA, where I taught there for eight years before I came here uh, to Cornell. Uh, Chef Kabui, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Please tell us, tell us your story. You know, yeah. how did you get started in this industry? Yes, uh, I was born by a dad and uh, who owned a restaurant, uh, and uh, for most of his life, that's the most of the work that he did all his life, and uh, until I was born, that's the place, that's the kind of work he he did, uh, and a mother who was a farmer, and I was born in a small village in the central part of Kenya, which is where the country where I was born, and uh, for those who might not be too familiar with the uh, map of the continent of Africa. Kenya is one country of very few, if any, that is cut by half by the equator. The equator cuts the country by half. So I was right at the center of the equator. And uh, my uh, parents uh, grew, had a farm, uh, is what's called subsistence farming. 
and uh, they had coffee and but they also grew all the kind of food that we ate so that's where i learned about food uh, basically and i you know we grew 95 percent of the food we had you know it was sustainable we had grain we had meat we all the, basically all the things that we needed and then i uh, spent 10 years there then went to the city for 10 years and I stayed there with my dad because that's where my dad owned a restaurant, which is the capital city of Nairobi. And uh, after that, I came to the U.S. But when I came to the U.S., I had never eaten food, one, outside of my own culture, uh, for any uh, significant uh, part of my, uh, uh, my time. And I had also not eaten frozen food nor canned food. Uh, and I never lived in any boarding facility. So when I went to campus, it was horrible food, the kind of food that I experienced, at least for my taste buds, was not culturally appropriate, it was not fresh, it didn't taste quite right for me. So anyway, so since then, I really became fascinated with how America could be so powerful with an image as an outsider, and yet the food be such low quality, at least in the <laughs> eyes of a young student on campus. So anyway, so that uh, developed a big interest on food. So is that, it was uh, like one, one thing after the next, you know, growing in the village, uh, living with my dad, you know, my dad being involved in the struggle for liberation and fighting for justice, uh, kind of all built together uh, to create a, this deep interest uh, in food. And I also like to read uh, quite a bit. You know, I had some really, really good uh, professors. I went to HBCU in Memphis, Tennessee, give, giving a shout out to Lomo and Owens. And uh, we had professors who really, really cared in pursuing and nurturing what interest that we had. And one of professor, Dr. Green, knew that I was really interested in reading. I just want to read as much as I can, philosophy, rational literature, and that kind of stuff. So by the time I finished, it occurred to me that food was the most, most political thing that you ever touch in your life. Mm. And that really, really fascinated me because that is such soft power that people who are previously oppressed, like my country, which was colonized by the British, an African-American who had uh, gone through this uh, process of enslavement in America, that I, it, it occurred to me that there is no way we can make any steps forward unless we become literate about the power of food, because that's one power that all of us possess. We possess that power to choose how uh, we'll consume the dollars that we have for food and to what end it is. And that's how I got uh, interested in food. So, yeah, so I, I'm also interested in pu pushing African food as a commodity that uh, is uh, commercial in, in sense. So stories that I write about, stories about uh, my growing up as a village boy, my experiences, because I just have a different perspective. You know, some of the other people, uh, like my, my uh, fellow chef, Lenise, was having an oven. Somebody was buying her an oven, man. You know, we were making mud pies. You know, <laughs> they didn't call, even call them pies when I was growing up in the village. That, that was not just something that we thought about. So anyway, so I, have, I, I just tend to have a different perspective about uh, food and that I've commodified that. And, uh, and yeah, as being in America, dealing with systemic racism in this country, it's also another way of dealing with it by creating your own business so that you create employment for other people and you don't have to deal with any glass ceiling. The glass ceiling is only the one you put in your head. And that's how I got mm -hmm. to where I am. What was your, so when you arrived uh, uh, in Memphis, what was your thought about like fast food? Coming from a place that at that time had no fast food to, yes. to American cuisine, if you will, fast food. Yes, uh, good. As a matter of fact, I'm writing, a, I'm writing a, a story about that experience in a book that's coming out called Black Food. Uh, and uh, and uh, that's my experience of my first bite of food in the U.S. When the students, uh, the two students came from uh, from college to pick me up from uh, from the airport, and they started by the fast by, by the gas station. It was called 7-Eleven, you know. And they went inside and they asked me, "Do I want a hot dog?" You know, and I want a drink. And I say, "Okay, yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I don't want a hot dog, but a, a Coke is the most American thing that I know. You know, most people <laughs> like." Uh, Coke, then they recognize Jesus, you know, or something. Right? <laughs> but uh, but uh, so hey, I, I, I had it and I tasted it and I spewed it. I would have sworn that I had taken a sip of a, a donkey piece. It sound, it tastes very, very different because of the kind of sugar that they use to make Coke in the U.S. You know, and then you know, and then you know, then I didn't know too much about a hot dog. I said, who would name a food? 
a hot dog. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's a dog. My dog eating a dog is bad enough, but it's hot. <laughs> it's, a, it's a story, man. It, it, it's in the book, man. Buy the book uh, or check out my blog. That's the kind of stuff I write about. <laughs> thank you, thank you for sharing. Because I, I know here teaching uh, at Cornell, we do have a situation where students just like you have never had American food or fast food or anything of that nature, and that experience for the first time is not always what it's led up to. Because you bring up a great point: an image of of food in the United States perceived around the world versus what actually uh, some of the opportunities. So uh, the last uh, panelist, uh, Chef Duprat uh, uh, dialing in from Texas. Uh, before I have him speak, I just want to give him a shout out, if you will, because he's really the one that started this process. One of my colleagues uh, here in the hotel school, uh, Giuseppe and, and Chef Duprat go back a long time. Another one to start this conversation back in November. Um, and this is how this programming all came to be. So Chef Duprat, what is going on with you? Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be with you guys today. It's an honor for me. Um, <clears throat> I mean, me speaking after Kobui, after Alex, after Chef Lenise. I'm not a speaker. I'm a chef. Oh. So, how about briefly um, how, how I started and how when I met Alex, that changed my life till today. My name is Ron Duprat. I'm a chef. I was born and raised in Haiti. I came to the United States on a boat. I was on a boat for 27 days. And there's so many things after that, after that, after that. And I started working in the kitchen with a chef uh, by the name of Philip Moron, who took me under his wing. I learned everything from washing dishes, pantry, and the list goes on. I uh, have the opportunity to study in France, so I want to call the cuisine, come back, work at the Ritz-Carlton, the youngest chef, I don't know, I usually don't call myself a chef of color, I call myself a chef, the youngest chef at the Ritz-Carlton, and after that, doing so many great things, um, you know, uh, work some of the most prestigious places in the world, such as the Montauk Yacht Club, uh, Pelican Bay, uh, Gulf Harbor, um, so many orders. Uh, but doing all that, doing all that, and uh, I became a diplomat. I became, uh, I was handpicked by Helen Clinton to be a diplomat for the State Department, talk about the world. I went to Italy with John Kerry, where I cook American food. <laughs> I'm this kid in Haiti, travel with John Kerry to talk about food. But after all that, I was handpicked by Michelle Obama for the Let's Move initiative. Uh, eat, kids eat, play, um, 30 minutes a day, and all that good stuff. But what's most important in 1998, 1999, uh, because, you know, my life at this point, because of uh, uh, racism, uh, some of us were separated because, you know, uh, there was not too many executive chefs look like me and talk like me. So I was more interacted with French chefs, uh, uh, Pierre Doucin, uh, Randall Cox, Adam Savage. But when I became the stand at the Montauk Cat Club, I believe it was 1998 or 1999, I met this man. Uh, we went to this place. I had a bottle of Dom Perignon, uh, I heard that this is black chef you need to meet. So I went to this store because, you know, all my chefs is white chefs mm -hmm. to see a black chef. Mm -hmm. I bring him a bottle of Dom Perignon. I, I, I'm not sure if he was 96 or 97. Uh, um, I'm not sure about the time. It might be 96 or 97, one or the other. We went to this restaurant where talk about and you know, and I say, who's this black chef? Because you know, everywhere, all my picture, you see 20 white chef and one this black token. Doesn't matter what I do. But when I met this man, I'll just ask you, I think my life has changed. I think sometimes I said I am who I am because of I'll just ask you. Because I know I'm expected to be the best doesn't matter what it is, but I'm not expect someone to be better than me 
And when I met him, he became a brother. I think my life changed. BCA changed my life. And I'm exactly who I am because the work of Alex Askew, the work of BCA, I was on Top Chef, Iron Chef, Bar Rescue, Beat Bobby Flay. The list goes on. People pay me to talk. Really. I'm not a speaker. If I'm, if I was as good a speaker as Alex asked you, I would be a billionaire because people pay me to speak. People pay me to show up and the list goes on. I think he gave me an opportunity to be myself and to support BCA to make sure I get more members. So people know about BCA. I'm a BCA board member, but I am more than a BCA ambassador who talk about BCA and I present BCA up. I can say I am who I am. If I can speak to you guys today, it's because of BCA. Don't say that was brainwashed because I want to be a French chap. As you know, uh, some of the places I run, the Ritz Carlton Naples, or the Montauk Cat Club, or the Bridgewater, or open the French State Cruiser and Casino, uh, $45 million and full of average. I'm this black kid from Haiti. But I think because Alex pushed me, we have to be the best. We have to do good food. We have to protect the company's asset. We have to go above and beyond. And I think I solely dedicate my life to BCA and what Alex did for me since we met in 97 or 96, one or the other. I'll just say one thing. Anytime someone comes to you and says, I respect you and presents you with a, a 93 Dom Perignon, you, you got their full attention. <laughs> so I knew Ron was legit. <laughs> because, you know, that doesn't happen in the black and brown world. Um, so that, you know, that maybe would happen with the Italians I worked for or something like that. So uh, I immediately knew that he was, uh, you know, uh, on the up and up and legit. And uh, I appreciate you, Ron. Thank you for those accolades. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. And, and Ron, since you threw that out there, Top Chef and Iron Chef, what what was it like, you know, uh, being in these different environments, these food competition shows, bar rescue, you're a judge, not necessarily competing, but what was that world like? Uh, the world is different. As you know, by being French, classically trained, I don't know how to do none of that stuff in 10 minutes. That's not me. If I cannot braise it, if I cannot roast it, if I cannot make uh, a brine, if I cannot get my spicy garlic, shallot, thyme, rosemary, olive oil, a little marinade, it's not me. It's not me. Granted, uh, when I went on Top Chef, true story, I never cast, I never fill out none of this paperwork. Uh, because they was looking for the best chef in the U.S. I guess they was working through James Beard, and they give my name, they call me. I say, you're crazy. No, I'm not doing that. Never heard of Top Chef. You know, I'm from New York. It, it's, you heard of Food Network. Never heard of Top Chef. So I went on. This is not for me, but I think Top Chef gave me a voice I didn't have, and I think it was a great opportunity. Everyone should give it a try. As I understand, uh, Top Chef is a young person's sport because it's compact. Uh, uh, Chef Duprat, uh, Chef uh, Askew was talking about BCA. We'd like to talk a little bit more about BCA and what it's currently doing and how does it have an impact on the culinary industry? Right. So, um, you know, BCA, as you, I mean, as you know, Doug, you know, uh, have, has a 25 plus year history. And um, I'm proud that. Um, we started a conversation 25 years ago that, um, you know, quite frankly, through everything that's happened uh, over the last 12 months, you know, we have people like Marcus Samuelson and um, other top really recognizable chefs of color that have endorsed the fact that the conversation of race needs to happen. Um, and, and I don't, you know, I, I, I really applaud the fact that, um, you know, uh, these individuals that are well recognized are stepping into it. I would caution that, you know, not to get caught up in a conversation that started 25 years ago, um, because that's not really progressive. We need to move from conversations to theories of action. And, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, things that could be said about diversity woes and trauma. And, and um, I get all of that because I lived it. 
but uh, we all, you know, there's two sides of a coin, right? So <clears throat> for black and brown people, and, and let's say, you know, really where, where this is moving into the black indigenous people of color or BIPOC population in the, in the food space, we have to really make sure that unless somebody's qualified, educatedly, educated, trained, um, you know, that, that's a colorblind issue. There, there, there's no free passes. Um, what we're talking about is our individuals that are educated, trained, mentored um, by chefs like Ron and, and myself and Chef Kabuli. That if we sign off on somebody, they're going to be able to get, you know, that upper mobile track job and career path. It's more or less about careers, right? Um, as I talked about all the different opportunities in the food service world, it's like a galaxy of, of, of a solar system. It's not just, you know, being a fine dining chef. I mean, chefs are going into healthcare now. There are four star healthcare facilities right now. And, you know, uh, I've seen them, I've been experienced because these doctors that make a million dollars a year are used to fine dining and they're gonna wanna eat it in healthcare. So we really have to think about, and the hotel scene as well. Um, but over the last uh, four years, uh, as a result of um, my uh, fellowship award as a, a racial equity and healy, healing um, cohort in the Kellogg Fellowship and now Castanilla Fellowship, our work has really turned into uh, mindful eating for the beloved community. Um, you can show that slide. Um, and, and really around how do we enter collectively around conversations that are inclusive of food, race, and social justice. Um, I, I will reiterate that, um, you know, uh, this may be touchy, but, you know, all chefs of color were mentored by a white male. I mean, I don't really uh, know of, of too many people that have, you know, that can say different. And, um, you know, because of that, I think that, you know, that's a good thing that we were investable in, 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 into being mentored. But we really, uh, you know, didn't take a lot of time to think about what our impact could be, not only in the industry as a voice, but in the communities that look like us. And so Mindful Eating for the Beloved Community is this um, uh, less early adoptive than it was four years ago, but now it's being well, well received. Um, you know, we have an announcement uh, today that we're proud of that the Hilton Effect Foundation has actually sponsored and supported a fellowship for the first time in the world um, that will be uh, announced today and that actually applications will be open call uh, to receive applications February 15th. So, so that individuals, food professionals can understand the, the food race, social justice, food systems, and all of the things that are necessary to understand social determinants of health, which are really, really important um, from anyone in the food space, since food is a you know something that, uh, like Chef Kabuli says, it's the most powerful political community organizing. I mean, it is amazing uh, as a fulcrum of change. And so um, you know, we're really proud that uh, the Hilton Effects Foundation has really stepped forward and said this is something that will uh, be in accordance with our travel with purpose, but also around you know, the equity and inclusion that we want to see in the food service, culinary, and hospitality industry. Congratulations. I want to say one of my first uh, idols was Chef Patrick Clark, uh, probably one of the greatest line cooks ever. Uh, Chef Patrick Clark, he passed away, oh, several, well, more than several years ago in 98. Uh, he was at uh, a black chef at Tavern on the Green, the executive chef at Tavern on the Green, uh, and he worked uh, a lot of different restaurants. And to me, he was like, he was one of my idols growing up because he was he was doing it. He was yeah. doing it in a circle that nobody else was. And that's why I want to go to uh, Chef Lanise. You're you're an entrepreneur. You're a small business person, right? Yes. Uh, you're you're running. So what what's your drive? What's your ethos? You know. Who do you look to or look at for support or guidance as, as you weave the, the ups and downs of being a small business owner? Well, first, let me just go back. This is my second career because I've been a director in a homeless shelter for many, many years. So I was feeding 
making desserts and making foods and feeding the homeless population for a long time. But when I went to culinary school, I, um, during my externship, I met someone named Natty Roman. <clears throat> Excuse me. And Natty is a big, big, well, was a big, big part of BCA Global. So she is who brought me in. She's my ethos. She's the one who brought me in and let me know all about what BCA was. She saw a lot of potential in me. She introduced me to Alex. We've been joined at the hip ever since. Not sure how good that is at times, but we we are our but we are buddies. And Alex and I have um, we've done a lot with the organization. So things that I can remember with BCA and doing a lot is when we used to do it, the black tie events, mm -hmm. and we had the students come in of all diverse um, backgrounds. And they actually prepared the foods from appetizers to desserts. And it was such a wonderful thing to help mentor those students and help them prepare that for, oh, gosh, Alex, what do we have, like 500 people there maybe? Mm -hmm. About 500 people. <laughs> and to see these students be so enthusiastic, because it's one thing when we learn something in the classroom. It's another one we have to put it to practice. So watching that is just, and helping with that, is something that I look forward to getting back to when hopefully COVID is at rest. Mm -hmm. we, ho we all hope and pray with that. There's great questions coming in the chat. I'm gonna sprinkle those questions uh, throughout. Please keep them uh, uh, coming. Uh, and, and I have a, a, a question for, uh, actually for Chef Duprat and Chef Kabui um, as two individuals who, who came to the United States. Um, one of the questions that ha somebody has there is, how do we combat the, the whole white influencer, food culture, appropriation, uh, taking over recipes that now they say that they're theirs or they claim to have experience? How, how, do, we, how do we handle that? How do we deal with that? Uh, uh, Chef Kabui, would you like to start off with that? <clears throat> uh, that's a very good point. Uh, I think... Um being a person who is both African and Black. Obviously, I, I was African when I came to the U.S., but as soon as I landed, I, I gained an identity. I didn't negotiate for it. You know, I, I wasn't prepared for it. I became Black, right? But anyway, so having those two uh, experiences, uh, it's been fascinating how we also live in a world of denial. If people are oppressed, then there are consequences that uh, come out of that oppression. The advantages and the dis disadvantages of both. You know, not that I choose to go through oppression, but there are things that I understand as a person of African descent that a white person will never understand. But I'm saying all that to say that the idea of appropriation is what oppression means. People oppress you so that they can take things that you do have of value. Anything that you have of value is, and that's how wealth has been built in this country. And that's not hateful. That's not uh, scaling the uh, the White House, uh, the, uh, the 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 Senate, or Capitol Hill. Is just the truth. And America lives in denial. We live in denial. What are you telling me? What are you asking me? Is to explain <laughs> what denial is. We live in denial. We believe as though. Everybody who has had a, a head start should run and arrive at the same time with a person who started 100 years later. So how do we deal with that? We become extremely honest. I believe that African, and I hold the position that people of African descent have the most role to play in making things better. I'll say something and not to be contrarian. I don't try to be the best. I just want an equal footing like everybody else. If everybody shows up and they get whatever, I, I don't, it's not, it's not a begging, it's not a, a, a show thing, it's not a competition. Hey, do I qualify for the same thing that everybody else um, qualifies for? Because if it, it's already a form of, of another oppression where you say that a black person has to do twice as much to earn, okay, already we've been doing, we've been working for so long, or we've been oppressed and we've been uh, suffering for so long. And this not to be negative. This is just another thing. People tell me, hey, be positive. <laughs> how am I going to be positive? Or how can I be anything else other than what it is? If you're going to deal with uh, appropriation, 
we ourselves have to take the responsibility. And that's why I'm not afraid and I'm not ashamed to say, uh, to say some of the things that I say because I take a personal responsibility. And what do I do? I write about it. Okay, whatever it is that needs to be done, you do it. Oh, I go, I speak about it. And I speak very, very honestly. Yeah, and I think that's a very uh, 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 fast place that we should uh, start. We should have an honest, honest, honest expression of where we're starting from and exactly what we want to do. It's one thing to say Black Lives Matter. But uh, I wrote a uh, blog article that, uh, dealing with this uh, uh, subject, and the point was Black, Black Lives Matter has to first be a philosophical position before it's a philosophical statement. So you have to articulate what is it that you, okay, okay, every lives matter. Okay, what if the slave master just said in 1861 uh, said, you don't have to be emancipated, you matter. Okay, well, what would that have uh, done? It wouldn't have done it. What? We wanted solutions, we wanted results, we wanted change, we want equal opportunity in front of the law. If other people are being shot and we are shot, that's a different story. But if you're being shot at, at a different rate uh, uh, and then other people, Although our criminal uh, um, uh, engagement does not qualify that, those are the issues to have. Those are just uh, society issues that we have to have. So how do we combat that? By taking personal responsibility, not only in some of the things we do, but in everything we do. I take that role in the way I raise children, in the way I talk to my neighbor's children, in the way that I act, in the way I carry myself, in the way I spend my money, in the way I engage all myself, because a better... Uh, world for people of African descent, resorts to a better America. I know that. If I'm living in America, I, I'm from Kenya, but my first thing that I need to worry about if there was a place that I, I want to turn the fire out is where I am right now and where I have my kids. And a better life for me, a better life for my kids is an investment for the rest of America. And I think that's a, 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 the easiest place for me to start. And, and Chef Dupri, anything to add about uh, uh, dishes and, and, and people now all of a sudden say, I can cook X cuisine with no real training behind it? Well, I want to piggyback in uh, Rita Mukilji question. That's where the question comes from, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So there's a couple pieces to that question. One of... Uh, the first African-American graduate from CIA in 1947, one of the few things he said, you have to be able to do things better. Not do more, but do better. So what's that mean? If you look at from the question talking about think the white sommelier, like whatever the, the question is, Here's the thing. If 2021, we're talking about the top 20 black chef, to me, I think it's insulting. People think it's a big deal. Oh my God, I'm the top 20, 20 best black chef. I think it's insulting. From her questions, um, as we're talking about black chef, I mean, I know there's plenty. I don't know how many minority sommeliers we have. I don't know. I was jokingly talking to Alex. I said, if you find me a black sommelier, I will pay you this. Let's go back to that question. Sometimes I think you cannot wait for somebody to hand you something. I think we have to push the envelope to be better. We need more black sommelier. Actually, minority is an American, Native American, Hispanic, Indian, whoever it is. I think it is the time for us to have honest conversation, but not just point finger. If we do that, 200 years from now, we will do the same thing. It's, it's not like they're lying, whatever method they use, whatever it is. I think it's us who need to look among ourselves, what can we do better? What can, how can we do it better than them? We need to learn about wine. We need to learn about grapes. We need to learn about season. We need to learn about pairing. I think we need to step into that space. 
when Alex said, okay, we're going to sit at the table, we need to have that conversation, I think we have to have those honest conversation, number one, to make us better, number two, so we can be honest about our conversation, number three, well, the education, number one, number two, honest conversation, everyone have a seat at the table, don't expect to get nothing handed to you. Nobody will hand you anything. You have to work for everything. I think we need to do a better job. I think BCA, Alex, need to spread his wing, talk about like what is my eating for my beloved community, what is wine training so us can know more about wine. You can be the best chef in the world, ladies and gentlemen. But if you don't have that wine experience, Mm-hmm. Whether you pair a white, red, a pinot, a cabernet, or whatever, a prosecco, or a rosé, whatever it is, you're probably worthless. If you work some of the most prestigious places in the world, you cannot mm-hmm. fake a wine pairing. Again, I'm not disagree with her question, but I think we have to have honest conversation whether it's food pairing, whether it's food growing, where the food comes from, how the food get from the farm to the table, and all that good stuff. Mm-hmm. And he was referring to his, uh, Jefferson Evans, who was the uh, first uh, black graduate of Culinary Institute of America uh, when it was located at its original location right. in New Haven, uh, Connecticut. Uh, 1947. Yes, uh, the Culinary Institute of America uh, started as a trade school for uh, GIs getting out of the war um, on the GI Bill, so that that, that institution started, uh, and it moved to its current location in the late 60s, opening up in the early 70s. Uh, there's a couple more questions in the chat. Please keep them coming. Uh, I'm bouncing around the questions. I'm, I'm working through them, so if, if, if you're still one of there, I, Give me a chance, but keeping, <laughs> yeah. on, keeping on this thread, uh, somebody asked, uh, as a white chef and a nonprofit director, how do I encourage and empower my students, mostly uh, BIPOC, people of, of indigenous or of color, in an appropriate manner? You know, how how can they relate? Uh, and it looks like Chef DePratt wants to take that question. I see him waving his hand. <laughs> yes. A couple of things is what I said before. Uh, they all can become members of BCA. I will put the link so they get the application. And a couple of things. I am asking them. I'm going to go piggyback on what Chef Kabui said. It's about honesty. Uh, uh, what, what's that mean? What's that mean? It's, I'm lucky enough, I never, my whole career, I never interview for a job. I never look for a job. I always handpick. So not everyone going to be as lucky as me. But there's a couple of things you can do. Number one, if I waste my time, set up an interview for you. If you don't come on time, that's disrespectful, number one. Mm-hmm. Number two, if I hire you, you think you're going to be on your phone, that's disrespectful. Number three, mm-hmm. if you come in with your pen always down in your ass, whatever it is, that's disrespectful. Again, let's go back. If personal respect, it's make sure, because food is love. Doesn't matter how you are. Uh, uh, people create story to be in food industry. Whether they were a drug dealer, they became famous, and everybody think they can go sell drug to become famous. But nobody talk about education first. I think that's what makes BCA different than most, than other educations. Oh my God, this guy was an Oprah. He was a drug dealer, whatever, whatever. He's so famous. But you know what? Nobody sit down and said, you should go to school. You should learn. You should be mentored by a good chef. You should respect all the culinary principle, all the ethic, being honest, sincere, and respect. I think that's what that person already reached out to me, and that's what I'm going to tell her. And I, and I would add to that, too, is, um, you know, one of the great things about this industry, and this is uh, for for students, is and there is you could go anywhere you want. You could write your own story in a lot of different ways. I mean, 
I've been lucky. I've moved 26 times. I've lived in a lot of major cities and small levels. <laughs> and, and that's what's great about the industry. I used to say as a kid, why do I want to read a book? I know that's controversial, but my whole thought about when I was a kid is why do I want to read somebody else's story? I want to make my own story. I want to write my own book opposed to reading somebody else and what and what they did. Uh, and that's one of the things I, I tell my students is like, go write your own story. Uh, in the culinary world, you, you could do that. Now, is it going to be easy? Absolutely not. Uh, is there going to be setbacks? Yeah, probably. Uh, if there's not, you're lucky. Uh, but you can still, in a lot of ways, uh, write your own, own story and then go from there. And that's why uh, somebody uh, also wrote in, um, uh, uh, and uh, since we have entrepreneurs on this panel, uh, you know, what advice to give to a young African-American woman who's trying to start her own company with a purpose? Like, how do you balance that? You got you gotta be financially viable, because uh, if you don't have the cash flow, then you're not gonna have a business. But still maintain that purpose. Um, how I do think, you balance um, those two? Well, I think first of all, if you have a day job, don't quit your day job to become an entrepreneur. You need to save your money. You need to keep your day job, save your money until you have enough where you will be able to pay your bills because everyone's not going to be a success overnight. So you have to save. So I tell everybody, please, if you go on social media, everybody wants to be an entrepreneur, but they don't tell you the struggle that's behind it. I used to be up at two and three o'clock in the morning, baking cakes for orders and still had to be to work by eight o'clock in the morning. And I had young children. So it's not easy. So I tell everybody, please do not quit your job and think that you're going to be an overnight success. But when you start, whatever your, your trade is going to be, whether it's baking, whether it's baking dinners, whatever it's going to be, take that money and save it separately from your household money. Put it separate. Do not intertwine the two. That's going to be your nest egg. When you feel you have enough that's comfortable and you feel you can tell that day job goodbye, then you do it. But please don't listen to other people and say, oh, girl, or, oh, guy, you could go do this. I've heard it many a times. People have wanted to invest in me and say, let me get you a bakery. Let me help you with the bakery. Had I listened, I would be really, really struggling today, especially with COVID going on. So <clears throat> keep your day job, but say, but bank that money in your craft and save it and open up a separate account, open up a separate account where you're not touching that money. And you go from there and build your clientele, build your clientele through social media, through friends and family. But what Ron said is very important. You must be on time. You must do, if you tell someone you're going to have a product ready for them at a certain time, it needs to be ready. You can't be saying, Oh, can you give me another half an hour? I, I was running a little bit late. No, you are the, um, experienced person here, you need to be on time. You need to show them that you're all about business. And once you give them a good quality product, they will tell their friends and families about you and word of mouth will grow. And I'd have to say, you know, any small, any small business operator has a passion. If you don't have a passion for, for that product, you're not, it's, you're not going to be successful. Absolutely. You're not Absolutely. Gonna be, and that passion helps get you through those challenging times because I'm sure Chef Lanise, it's not always been easy and bills sometimes this, but you know, yeah. it's, it's a challenging road. It's, it's not easy at all. It's a passion. It's the love of it. It keeps me out of the therapist office. So it's good. Yeah. Can I add something real quick? I know we don't have that much time left uh, for all African-American entrepreneurs who have that question. The number one thing I would ask that person to understand PL. So many business fail because no one understands PL. They think they can invest a million dollars, but the time you know, they're two million out of debt. You need to understand the profit and loss, whether it's purchasing, whether it's controlling inventory, whether it's the payroll, whether it's the book. They need to understand that. That's my advice to that young African-American who want to open that business. And I would, ha I would have to say it's, it's a numbers game. Any business is a numbers game. Yes. And the better you understand your numbers, still not gonna guarantee you're gonna be successful, but it, 
certainly increases the odds. There's a couple of questions uh, regarding uh, nutrition. And that's why, uh, uh, Chef Kabui, this is kind of uh, one of the things that you're working on. And somebody asked, you know, insights to nutrition that's more culturally, racially, ethnically relevant. Um, so how do we how do we get on beyond nutrition uh, is present in every cuisine. Every cuisine uh, has something in it that might not be healthy, that might be healthy, but how do we broaden that spectrum of what people consider as healthy cuisine opposed to that little narrow box uh, that most people look at? A very interesting question. Uh, if, I, if, I, if I may, uh, I just wanted to add uh, one uh, uh, point about uh, opening a, a business uh, and you know, uh, surviving in business. And uh, I didn't want to. I didn't want to uh, miss the opportunity to say that people need to learn how to work together. One of the things that a lot of businesses uh, benefit from, because no business is going to be on an upward scale. The one thing that I've noticed myself that uh, over time that separates people who are more likely to fail or to do well starting out is how well we work with others. You have to be really, really smart about how you allocate your time in investing in others so that they can invest in you when you need to. I just wanted to add that mm -hmm. for a person getting business. Now, what about an uh, interesting point that you raised? Uh, I find it um, uh, interesting when you scour through our history to find that the first people who label themselves based on what they eat is found in the first book that they, was written in Europe, which is Homer, the Iliad. And in the book, the Iliad, it has a story about a people who are called the lotus eaters. The a lotus is a type of flower. And you know, when, it, when those people would consume the, the flower, you know, it's like weed, you know, they'll be high and they wouldn't worry about anything else. So, anyway, so that's the first time, at least as far as I know, uh, that uh, people call themselves by the, uh, what they ate until people start calling themselves vegetarians, you know, and then before that, there was vegans. There are things that are, are, are or type words that are used now that were not, used when, were not in use when I first came to the U.S. about three decades ago, right? I'm saying that to say that it's a very new phenomenon for people to eat based on the nutritional content of food. And the reason probably more important for me to raise uh, a point to, to, to raise here is that uh, the reason why people or uh, food is marketed based on nutritional uh, benefit is for commercial purposes, for marketing purposes. You know, whether you, if I tell you to eat kale because it has vitamin D or not, uh, somebody is selling you medicine, that somebody is preparing you to think in terms of, uh, you know, other chemicals other than food. And as a result, we stray off of food. The reason why we have bad food, that is uh, the reason why we are having health issues that need to be corrected by some of these benefits that, but are being touted by some of these marketers is because there was bad food in the beginning. So we need to always keep the focus on food. But if you eat food that is wholesome, that's organic, that's re researched well, that you know, hey, this food it does not have detrimental issues or that, that does not cause uh, any harm to yourself. That's how human beings have evolved. Uh, that's number one. Number two, that uh, I think food is still, for the most part, colonized. That's why I used, uh, came up with the uh, idea of food literacy. If you talk about a person being illiterate, all of us know what an illiterate person does uh, or cannot do. You know what their limitations are. You can't tell somebody who is literally to write your letter or read your letter or, or read a sign or whatever it is. We know that. We understand that very well. In the sense, but it's less clear when we say somebody is food illiterate. Because obviously, if we have such serious uh, health uh, issues, crisis, based on the kind of food that we eat, and we have so much bad food in the market, it must mean that people are, a lot of people are illiterate about food, that they are going buy things so as food that is actually food stuff, it's actually not actually food. So anyway, so I think being literate about food is the answer to that person's question. And, and I 100% agree. I mean, how many people don't know where their food is coming from? Uh, how many people don't know where, where certain things like milk or other things come from? And being food 
literate uh, helps to solve these different things. Uh, does not necessarily have to have your own farm, but do you do you have the ability to make these decisions uh, when when you're out grocery shopping and understanding what that ingredient is? And also I'd have to say how to prepare it. Because if you look at certain things like beans, which beans are in a lot of cultures around the world, it's a very nutritional uh, uh, plant uh, but a lot of people don't know how to cook beans correctly, so then they pass it up in the aisle because they don't understand how to deal with dried beans or, or fresh beans. And, and you can name of culture, and there's beans in it one shape or form. We have about uh, five minutes left. Uh, one person is asking, is actually a really good question because I think it's a challenge, and this is going to be for you, for, uh, Chef, ask you, recruitment. You know, somebody is saying uh, their employee roster, they want to diversify their employee roster, but they're having a challenge of just getting um, uh, a different mixture of applicants. Um, so, so when it comes to recruiting, what are some best practices uh, when it comes to recruiting and diversifying uh, your, your workforce um, and, and beyond many different ways. It could be uh, different uh, uh, abilities. Uh, it could be uh, different types of genders or how people identify to their genders. It could be different types of ethnic backgrounds. How, how does that, what are some tips on recruiting in that space? Right, well, I mean, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion has is, is always been a struggle uh, throughout all of food service, again, uh, 2003, I, I was the first black regional chef in healthcare in, in history. And, and, and that's really not that long ago. But what I will say is there's, there's a couple of different strategies. Um, first of all, people are very smart and smarter about who they want to work for and they do more research. So, um, you know, by putting someone of color on, on your, uh, you know, on your homepage of your website, um, that's not going to cut it and be so convincing um, because people talk about what the, uh, you know, equity environment are in different spaces and places within food service. So you really do have to have a, and again, part of the context that I'm hearing from overall conversation today is honesty, right? So you really need to have, um, you know, a strategy that's based on honesty of, um, and examples of individuals that you're trying to attract that have been successful within the company. Um, if you don't, there's going to be a barrier. That's the first thing. Um, number two is, you know, um, the workforce that you have already, and, and, and again, there's two levels, obviously there's, um, you know, there's the food service worker, then there's management, then there's upper management. You know, there needs to be a clear um, and authentic history of success stories of individuals that have uh, raised to the ranks and can talk about, you know, their stories as testimonials. It's a very hard sell um, not to have an example of what you're trying to do already in place and sell it as we already have this culture that's already um, kind of uh, been authenticated and validated as being true to um, equity and inclusion. I will also add that coming down the pipe is going to be indexing. Um, you know, indexing is going to be within the next several years, how people look for jobs and how every food service company uh, outside of food service tech and other things, but primarily what I'm concerned as the space that uh, I operate in the food service, is that you know they're going to have to publicly report based on environmental social governance and corporate social responsibility guidelines what their goal of equity inclusion has been and if they've reached or, or ascertained that that's going to be a very transparent um i would you know really transparent uh, form that people are going to look at to see do i want to work for this company do i see myself spinning a career within that company. So, you know, there, there are really a lot of strategies. I mean, I think that if you um, send someone uh, that's trying to recruit someone of color, that's not of color, I think there's a barrier right there when you, you know, cross those uh, questions about, I know how you feel, and some other things that might be a little bit, um, you know, uh, less authentically received. 
but I do think there are strategies, especially now, where people can uh, form affinity groups or em- uh, employee employee resource groups that can really help companies understand where those barriers are and really overcome them and attract that talent that reflects the customers that they're trying to serve. Because I would add today, you know, if you look at uh, people talk about millennials, well, uh, millennials now range in age between 23 and 40. Uh, Now you're starting to have Gen Z's coming into the marketplace. And one of the things that they're looking for is they're looking to spend their money in companies that provide a great product, but also have a good ethical business. And that ethical business could be from sustainability, uh, could be dealing with climate change, it could be dealing uh, in the in the racial equity space. That's what they're looking for. And I think the companies uh, that recognize that um, and build platforms to address these situations, uh, that uh, would be uh, where they want to spend the money. I know a lot of people say they don't want to spend money. They do. They're just very particular where they want to spend their money. Uh, so uh, we are out of time. I'm actually a minute over. I want to thank our fabulous panelists uh, for a great discussion. Um, you know, Chef Duprat, Chef Lenise, uh, Chef Kabuya, and Chef Askew, thank you for taking uh, time. And thank you, attendees, for taking a little bit of time out of your day. We greatly appreciate it. Uh, next Thursday, uh, we have another conversation uh, with... Uh, the, uh, she is the chief of staff of the NAACP. She actually went to the hotel school, um, class of 99, and she'll be speaking, uh, Iris Sims, and she'll be speaking with our dean here in the hotel school, Dean Walsh. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy the rest Thank of your you. day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.